Welcome to This Week in Medicine, November 15th, 2021. Thank you for joining us. Brought to you by the Fox Health Foundation. Uh, we have a wellness center, which is up and running, very active. We started In Balance Nutrition, PLLC at gmail.com. Sponsored by the Fox Health Foundation. Carrie is our excellent nutritionist. You can contact her through this email. Consultations initially are provided for you by Fox Hall Foundation, and then you can contract with Carrie for ongoing nutrition consultation. Um, interestingly, uh, in the next slide, we'll talk about the connection between yoga and adult movement class, which we call Key Adult Class. Key is an adult martial arts class, which is designed to help you with balance, position sense, strength, core, uh, it could be considered similar to some things that we do in yoga, some things that people do in Tai Chi classes. If you're interested, uh, contact Mr. Ricky at the Active Masters program through the website, either the Fox Hall Foundation website or the Kenzen Do Karate website. So interestingly, this weekend we were listening to On Being um, in the morning and we heard a quote, actually Dr. Yamamoto heard a quote from Dr. Bessel van der Kolk. Uh, many of you may know that he's a psychiatrist who wrote the book, The Body Keeps the Score, Brain, Mind, and Body in the Healing of Trauma. But in, in particular, a quote that he mentioned in his discussion uh, regarding yoga and martial arts and the connection between the two, which is what we did at the Fox Hall Wellness Center. So I'll just read this quote from the transcript uh, yoga turned out to be a very wonderful method for traumatized people to activate exactly the areas of consciousness, areas of the brain, areas of your mind that you need to regain ownership of yourself. And he's talking about this in terms of people who have previous trauma. But you really don't need trauma to experience the benefits of yoga. Nonetheless, the quote continues, not only yoga, you could maybe do martial arts or Qigong. And Mr. Ricky and I were discussing this at the Wellness Center, the connections between martial arts and yoga, and he and Tala have been talking about it as well, as a way to engage your body in a very mindful and purposeful way. It resets some critical brain areas that get very disturbed by trauma, but it also just sets some critical brain areas. So again, you don't have to have the trauma to benefit from martial arts and yoga. We find this in our kids who are raised in martial arts and in yoga, uh, people who are raised with ballet techniques, that that connection between mind and body is incredibly useful and powerful and indeed can heal the emotional sides of the body and contribute to wellness. So this was just a really fun and interesting connection that we heard over the weekend that connected so well with our Fox Hall Foundation and our Fox Hall Wellness Center. Another thing that he discussed was heart rate variability. So in the transcript of this talk, there was also a discussion about heart rate. Van der Kolk said that heart rate variability, meaning does your heart rate speed up? Does it slow down? It's particularly when you sleep or you're at rest or you're meditating. That variability, the ability to increase your heart rate and decrease your heart rate is associated with wellness. The lack of variability of heart rate, if your heart rate's the same all the time, associates with anxiety, stress, trauma, and unwellness or being sick. The reason I bring this up is that we check heart rate variability quite a bit in our office. Some of you may be familiar with this device, which is called a CAM monitor, C-A-M. This is a sticker and attached to it is a little metal device. We like patients to wear this for seven days. We're often looking for atrial fibrillation because of symptoms that you tell us about or if we're working you up for a TIA or a stroke or a neurologic event, we'll ask you to wear one of these for seven days. They're the modern version of what we used to call the Holter monitor, which had a bunch of wires attached to it and you would wear a tape recorder on your waist. That's quite old fashioned and really typically only gave us 24 to 48 hours of recording, whereas this monitor can give us seven days of recording. We'll often use it for a diagnosis of fainting or the medical term is syncope, uh, or if you just have dizziness. There are a lot of reasons to have patients wear this monitor, but one incidental finding that we see quite often is this pattern of heart rate variability. So if I see a heart monitor and Dr. Yamamoto will often show this to me where there's no heart rate variability, the heart rate is fast often and the same all the time, that correlates with the patient being unwell. 
and not so much unwell in terms of atrial fibrillation or a primary heart arrhythmia, but unwell in terms of other parts of the body not being healthy. So this is a very interesting connection, both for the connection to our wellness center and also the connection to what we do in the office, monitoring patients' heart rates. So we'll talk to you about heart rate variability. Um, in particular, some of you, when you come in for uh, symptoms related to any of these, heart rate variability is very important. So what stressed you out this week? Well, there are some new things. There's a new wave of COVID, and particularly North and Eastern Europe, not so much in South and the West. Actually, Portugal's doing great, but that's because Portugal has great vaccination rates. The winter holidays are tough, especially as we're trying to plan to get together, travel, uh, and who's vaccinated and who's not. Uh, Moderna is a hard vaccine to find, uh, so a lot of people are going with Pfizer, which is certainly fine. There's still some booster confusion. Vaccines for kids are rolling out, and even my pediatrician's office has a Pfizer vaccine for kids, so that's exciting. November 22nd, the federal employee and, contract, and federal contractor's vaccine deadline uh, is coming. And we've had a couple of questions in the office about people trying to get a medical exemption for the federal employee and contractor vaccine deadline. Um, so far, we haven't found anybody who qualifies for a vaccine deferment. Um, we have certainly been asked, but it doesn't look like anybody really qualifies. People who say they're too sick to get the vaccine are actually too sick to get COVID. Um, so just for people who are concerned about getting their vaccine on time, November 22nd is the deadline. Um, and so far, we've seen a vibrant long fall, probably brought about a little bit by global warming because the temperatures were so warm so late. So that actually was a point of happiness and not stress this week. So following on that, what is going on in Germany with COVID? Um, this was from two days ago, German vaccines lag, cases spike, um, and this was in Bloomberg. This was actually a really good article. So if you can find this article from two days ago, it was an excellent review of what is happening in Germany. It appears to be what, hap what is happening in Germany is that the eastern part of Germany, influenced by uh, years of communism and not being part of West Germany, has had a very slow uptake in vaccines and a lot of vaccine skepticism. Unfortunately, parts of southern Germany also have some vaccine skepticism. So as you would expect, just like in the United States, there are parts of Germany where vaccine skepticism has prevented adoption of vaccines and therefore the case rate has really gone up. So this is a problem in Germany of, again, lack of vaccination and distrust of science and distrust of the government, which is very unfortunate. Rising case rates in Europe, look at Austria. We'll go to Austria on the next slide. Netherlands has an increase. The United Kingdom has been pretty steady uh, and then Germany had this really pretty big spike. But look at Italy. In the south of Europe, there really hasn't been a spike because vaccination rates are so high. So the concern always is, is this gonna happen to the United States next? Well, if you look at Europe and you look at the United States, you'll see that there are some similarities, pockets of the population that have not been vaccinated. And that really looks like that's the message coming out of Europe right now. The pockets that are not vaccinated are definitely getting hit by COVID again. And today, as I was driving home, uh, the radio announced that Austria is planning a lockdown. This is amazing. So in Austria, uh, if you are not vaccinated, they're not going to let you leave your house or your apartment unless you need to buy food or work. This is really pretty drastic. 65% of Austria's population is fully vaccinated, which is one of the lowest rates in Europe, but they are actually going on lockdown. Um, it's interesting. Uh, that's happening in Austria. We'll have to see what happens elsewhere in the EU. So uh, there's a new idea that's been floating around for the past couple of weeks. Should anyone get a booster who's over 18? not just people with health issues, not just people living in long-term care facilities, but should everyone be eligible? So Pfizer-BioNTech asked the FDA to authorize the COVID booster for people 18 years and older who don't have specific risk factors, who just want a COVID booster. So that was submitted uh, probably sometime last week. Uh, there's no expected meeting of the FDA advisory panel for November, so it may be put off into December. Uh, but there are already people who are promoting this idea that anybody who wants to get a booster over 18 could get one. 
one of those people, Scott Gottlieb. Uh, interestingly, on this bio sketch of Scott Gottlieb, I took it off the Pfizer website because indeed uh, he is part of Pfizer. He was the commissioner of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, and he advocates that people over 18 should get the booster, and he is worried that we didn't do boosting early enough. So experts do approve of a universal over 18 booster. And then these states allow boosters. California, Colorado, New Mexico, and West Virginia uh, are in line with what Scott Gottlieb said about 18 years and older, go ahead and get a booster, all adults. So this may become a trend. Um, also, as you'll see in the next couple of slides, you can get a booster if you attest that you have high risk. So you can do self-attestation in Maryland. So that means any Marylander who presents to a provider that they are eligible for a booster is allowed to say, I'm eligible for a booster. You don't have to provide proof. You don't have to provide a doctor's note. You cannot be turned away if you attest that you are eligible for a booster dose. So this is from the Maryland, maryland.gov website. In DC, you can do the same thing. You can self-attest. If you feel that you are increased risk to get COVID and you're a high risk person, you can just say, I'm a high risk person and get a booster. Virginia is a little cagier. Um, it's not quite clear that you can just say, I'm at risk, uh, but they're trying to be as flexible as possible. So uh, the governor said, we're not gonna check people. We're not gonna ask for letters, but the clarity on self-attestation is not as evident in Virginia. Uh, but nonetheless, they are hoping that they can give out boosters when needed. Tony's tip of the week involves pacemakers and MRIs. This has been a big problem locally for us, and I have been working on this very aggressively for six months. We are trying to make it possible for patients with pacemakers to get MRIs. This is really not usually a problem. We had staffing for this before COVID. This has been a staffing crisis issue that we are unable to get pacemaker MRIs readily. So that means if you have a pacemaker um, and you need to get an MRI, it's difficult to get in our area. The one place we've been able to successfully get uh, MRIs on patients with pacemakers is at Washington Adventist at White Oak. We will continue to work very hard on getting our local hospitals and facilities to uh, restore a previously highly functioning program for MRIs for patients with pacemaker. Um, but this happened during COVID. It's hard to say that it was entirely a staffing issue. It was somewhat ignored in favor of the bigger issues of COVID. But now that we're trying to get back to normal, getting MRIs for patients with pacemakers is a higher priority. You'll remember that I've told you before, we have some of the longest lived people in the country in Montgomery and Fairfax County. So when you have people living that long, they're gonna have pacemakers. For the past five years, we have had this kind of pacemaker, which is called conditional or compatible. That means it's compatible with an MRI machine. It means it's safe to go through the MRI machine with your pacemaker. So if you've had a pacemaker pass, placed in the past five years, chances are there's no problem going through the machine at all, but you need nursing staff to watch you go through that machine. So it's not really a medical issue as much as it is a nursing issue. So locally unavailable, Older than five years, you likely have an incompatible pacemaker or, uh, with your, um, to do an MRI. But even if it's an incompatible pacemaker, we used to have a research protocol that we could use to get you your MRI. So Tony was able to find Washington Adventist will do this. They've already done a couple of MRIs for our patients. It's uh, not necessarily close to our region, but while we work out these regional issues with access, this is what we can do to help. Uh, fast pitch, it was suggested to me by Dr. Yamamoto that I give Dr. Fauci a break. So in the good old days of Schur's, here he is throwing the ball. Again, it's Diabetes Awareness Month. Uh, get a booster if you had a J&J &J vaccine. Consider a Pfizer or Moderna booster or if you were at risk and you can self-attest that you were at risk to get your booster. Uh, and if you live in West Virginia, you can just go and get it. It's okay to take your flu shot together, but just remember the additive side effects. And now that we are entering flu season soon, usually the first flu cases show up 
uh, in uh, pandemic proportions in January and February. Uh, most places will have a combined COVID influenza nasal swab. Obviously, because of the issues of immunocompromised patients in our office, we would not be doing the combined COVID and influenza nasal swab, but they should be readily available at many testing locations. Um, so remember, we're probably going to have to test for both since both illnesses are so similar, and that is coming around the corner. And that is it for this week. Remember, your foundational pyramid of health We'll go into this in more detail as uh, the months go along. And remember our book, You Can Prevent a Stroke. Thank you for your attention.